So we're going to look at fault diagnosis. So this is moving on. This is moving on from the, the previous lessons where we were looking at communication and we were looking at different types of faults. So diagnosis of a fault. So we discussed earlier about the communication, which is really important. So these are the logical stages for um, fault diagnosis. So identifying identification of any symptoms. This is where we, you know, we've said about talking to people. So if you were talking to someone or, you know, you can, this is where you can use some of your senses. When we looked at senses um, previously, if you could hear something crackling or you could smell something, um, you could chat to people asking when the fault happened, why they, uh, why something went wrong, what happened previously to the fault happening. Then you collect and analyze the data. Um, so what you can do is you can also look at some test certificates and things. And if you notice that something wasn't as good as it should have been on a previous uh, test results or, or you have a look at some data there, then you check and test. So what you can do then is, and what we'll have a look at in a little bit more detail, is, you know, if, if we were put a tester on something and we did an insulation resistance test and we knew that we were expecting to get a very, very high reading, but we had a very, very low reading, almost saying it was a short, but we knew that we had a short circuit. Or we would do a continuity test and we could do a continuity test maybe on a lighting circuit and we would see that, that we had no uh, continuity on a line conductor going from the circuit board to the light. Um, and what we could do is just check that we got our switches, check that we got our breakers, obviously going through safe isolation and everything. Or we could check to see if there was voltage present and what voltage it was, if it was a high or if, it, if we had a low voltage, so we had volt drop. And by looking at those different types of results, we could see what the type of problem was. So as an example, if we had a continuity test, say on a neutral going to a socket or a cooker, and we didn't have the arriving at that socket, and we could check that with a D, we would realize that there might be a break in that circuit. So then we could follow that circuit through, um, seeing if it had been damaged anywhere along the line. And then what we would do is we need to correct that fault. So we would either need to rewire either that one cable or all the cables, or it may just be that there's a loose connection somewhere. I always go for the obvious. It might be that in the neutral, in the back of the cooker socket, um, it's become loose. It wasn't tightened correctly. Uh, a lot of the time when you do fault finding, someone actually goes along and actually unscrews a cable um, because it could be quite a common fault. So don't always go and start rewiring and then when you get to the end, realize that it wasn't tight. And then what we have to do is, functional testing. So once you've corrected the fault, what you then need to do is test it before you liven it up to make sure it is working again. So you would do the check to make sure that you've got a faulty result, corrected the fault and check it again. Now restoration, which is the last bit, is that what might happen is you might have to take some plasterboard out of a wall um, or you might have to drill a new hole or do something. And restoration is all about making good. It's quite a common term for electricians to use the thing of making good. And that is basically where this is where your skills as a painter and decorator come in. So you might have to polyfill a back up a, a wall. Uh, and there's loads of things to look at quite carefully. If you were going to, to do something, remove the wallpaper and you'd have to have a conversation and it comes in with the with the owner of the property before you do that to make sure that you have an understanding because if there is a fault to take down a wall or do something and you are not a painter and so you need to explain to them saying i can fix the fault but you're going to get them to do that if it was a major job so these are the hazards um, and precautions and special requirements or special precautions so the loan. So you've got to be careful uh, when you're working alone. And these are all health and safety that we've looked at before. But working. So loan working. I spoke to one of my 
colleague uh, who does uh, who one of the ex students actually, and uh, he had that you could download on your phone, and you would set up or whatever it was, and it would have a telephone number for the office. And sort of every half an hour, a little beeper would be going off, and he would just hear, uh, and it would let them know that he was still. And you're working alone. Can you imagine crawling into a loft space and you're working? You might get an electric shock. You could have fumes. You could have various different hazardous hazardous areas, basically. And alone, you've got to be careful with that. So you need to keep people all the time. So hazardous areas, we've gone through that. Fires, well, they don't carry electricity, um, but you've got to be really careful because the light, um, when we looked at this in the classroom with the laser pointer, they actually, it has laser almost light shining through it and if you were to look down the end it could really damage your eyes and also the glass um, and I've got a really good video that we could look at at a later date is is really sharp and if you've got splinters of that it is you know so you've got to be careful we've got to be wearing the right PPE when we do it electrostatic discharge now we did this when we looked at a little bit about um, uh, electrical uh, science and things like this previously so capacitors they hold um, a, a charge so you know um, but you can also get uh, electrostatic build up so you've just got to be careful especially with electronic devices because you know the static discharge it can be in the thousands of volts and it can damage stuff electronic devices you've got to be really careful when you're using high voltages so if we were using uh, insulation resistance testing like we've done before we've got to make sure that we've got it on the right setting IT equipment we've got to be careful um, for several reasons that we've done uh, the backup before we take any power off um, and, and various things like that but also we've got to be careful that they don't have a battery backup so when you go to work on a situation and you think it's dead but you've isolated it but the battery backup has kicked in and then that circuit could become live High frequency, uh, which induce high voltages, um, and also capacitive circuits, which I just touched on. Presence of batteries, which I was saying about the IT, the additional sources of energy. So we've got to be careful like that. So maybe that there's a solar panel or a wind turbine. When we looked at the environmental unit, um, you know, you've got lots of things like that. And time control devices when you might go and work on an outside light and you might go and do the safe isolation process or you might check that the light's dead, but it's actually got a PIR or a time control on it. And obviously that won't come on until uh, it may, may only come on at five o'clock at night. So you might be working on there and then they want their outside lights to come on and it comes on. So these are things that you just need to check and make sure you've got uh, all the details on. So let me just come out of that quickly.